Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as promised, we are now about to commence the startup battle. Uh, we had an hour and a half session with the judges here who are sitting on the front line. So we have Vidisha Kungula Gunta Bokl, uh, who is the MD at uh, Sinals VC. Uh, they're actually offering a prize to the startups, a one to one meeting with the lovely lady. Kiara Sommer also, uh, the Senior Investment Manager at Heiten Kundefund, uh, also offering a one-to-one -one meeting with the winning startup. Nazir Zubairi, uh, CEO, CEO of Loft, um, who is here to make lovely comments and feedback, give lovely comments and feedback to the startups. And Jag Sai, who is the MD at Techstars, and again, those are the judges that spend an hour and a half with our eight startups. And the startups are now ready to pitch on stage and share with you their ideas. So, without further ado, the very first startup to pitch, they have five minutes to present, is, is, is uh, represented by Pedro uh, from Cerebral. Please welcome him to the stage. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Data Natives for the opportunity to pitch. Uh, so my name is uh, Pedro, and uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, the problem of uh, search and discovery in online e-commerce shops. And uh, particularly, I want to focus on the fashion domain, uh, because that's the domain we chose to focus on at Cerebel. Uh, sure. All right. So. Um, I think the uh, trends are clear, and I think a lot of the talks we already heard uh, show this. Kind of the way we're interacting with digital products is changing. Uh, we've already moved from you know, punch cards to keyboards to the mouse to touch, and our voice and vision. Um, and, and every step of the way, we're kind of bringing technology closer to the way that humans communicate and naturally interact with the world. And um, the same thing happens with e-commerce uh, shops. So if, if, you, if nowadays you try to go to an e-commerce shop and, and you input a query that is just a bit more complex or has some more contextual information, they will uh, fail uh, miserably. And really, the uh, problem is that even though these interfaces are evolving and getting more sophisticated, the technology that sits behind them is still very dumb. Uh, so where you would expect a shop to behave like a personal shopping assistant and be able to understand all the richness of natural language it just really doesn't work. And these trends, you can see these trends in you know, the success of devices like the Echo, the Echo Look, or, or the Google Home. And so uh, Cerebral is, aims to be the technology that is the brains behind all these uh, interfaces. And we're packaging this as a software as a service uh, in a set of APIs for voice and visual uh, conversational search and discovery in e-commerce. Now, we are betting on whole new modes of interaction. Like, we don't think that keyboard-based search is going to disappear. Uh, but we think that people will be expecting the systems to behave a lot more like personal shopping assistants um, would would behave, and, and particularly like shopping assistants that have a good uh, domain knowledge. And it's because we expect this domain knowledge from the people we talk to, shopping assistants, uh, that we at Cerebral chose to focus on a specific domain, and we picked fashion. And we picked fashion because it gives us a set of unmet challenges uh, that we're now tackling with the latest in uh, machine learning and uh, computer vision. Uh, for example, uh, a big part of how we uh, gain this domain knowledge of fashion is by analyzing the images themselves. Uh, so instead of relying on all the incomplete and noisy and error-prone product catalog data that we get from uh, our clients, we actually look at the images and extract a bunch of attributes from them. Uh, and then we categorize them into our own taxonomy, and we extract stuff, you know, what's the shape, what's the texture, the fabric, uh, the style of the uh, clothing item. Here's an example for summer dress, for example, and uh, right. So really, our vision is to kind of became, become the platform for conversational search and discovery in e-commerce at every point of sale. And we, as we expand our technology, we want to include more and more uh, domains in, as we move forward. 
Uh, so the competition slide, so I, there really aren't any companies out there that look at this problem the way that we do. Uh, but the closest we get to is really uh, search companies. And in this sense, we're kind of the all-in-one uh, solution that is multimodal, so it accepts all kinds of input and is also domain-specific, so virtually, vertically specialized. Uh, our current status, we're, we've been around uh, for about eight months. Uh, we released a private beta in June, and we've gotten great feedback so far. Um, we have some pilot projects going on with some fashion brands and uh, marketplaces. And, okay, and we're also uh, about to release a, uh, our own consumer app. So this will be a marketplace for sustainable fashion. And we want to use it as a test bed of ideas and, and a way to showcase our, our, showcase our technology. Uh, so we're ramping up our talks with investors at the moment. Um, and we want to raise a seed round to get more people, data scientists and engineers, to work on the technology uh, and also to ramp up our sales. Uh, finally, the team. So uh, we're three people at the moment. Uh, we have uh, years of experience building search and discovery uh, services at Rocket Internet. So my co-founder, Petar, built the DataJet team at Rocket Internet that served a bunch of uh, e-commerce players uh, worldwide. I joined that team and worked with him for about two years. So uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks you for uh, your attention. If you have any questions or you'd like to work with us, just reach out to me after this. Thanks. So as mentioned, I'm Nimrod from Onworks. Yeah, but before being Nimrod from Onworks, I was uh, Nimrod, the wind turbine technician. And as a turbine technician, you often get a phone call you know, first thing in the morning, what are you doing today? Uh, we need to, someone to go this or there. Uh, there's a turbine broken down, uh, which is quite exciting, actually. Then often you go to these turbines and you find turbines that are underperforming for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, probably the best and the most common uh, case would be Yamas alignment. So you see every turbine is, is uh, programmed from day one to look into the wind. The problem is that the majority of, pro of turbines don't do that. Uh, this is estimated to cost about 2% of the total power consumption, which ends up being 420 euros, uh, 420 million euros in uh, Europe every year that is lost. This is only one example from many other a failure or underperformance examples out there. Uh, but all these could really be boiled down to uh, two main pain points in the industry. So one is unplanned maintenance, the type that they call me up first thing in the morning and say go somewhere, is the majority of the maintenance today. And underperforming assets, uh, again, lose quite a lot of money. Together, it's about 4.5 billion euros that the wind industry uh, loses every year. And this will double by 2020. Um, so in order to fight this, the wind industry uh, tries and install more hardware and more sensors on their turbines or just send teams like myself and you know, do more measurements to get that information. Uh, th all this saying, saying all this, uh, the turbines today are already fitted with a supervisor and control and data acquisition system, SCADA, which is basically a fancy way of saying there's a bunch of uh, sensors all over the turbine who gives you data every 10 minutes, you get hundreds of parameters from all the different components. Now that's sort of where uh, we come in. So we are developing software for smarter wind turbines. Uh, you see, back in the field I ask myself, could there be a better way to, to, to plan the maintenance to detect these uh, underperforming performing turbines? So I brought that back to my team. Uh, Anatoly is a software engineer from the telecommunications industry. Kirill is a machine learning PhD student from the Technical University of Berlin. And what we basically ask ourselves is, is there a correlation within those parameters that would indicate those failures that we mentioned before? Now the answer that we've got to is yes. What we've, discussed, what we've developed is uh, deep learning algorithms that using the SCADA data, we could detect all these failures that beforehand you had to send people on site or put extra hardware in the turbines. Uh, to understand this a bit better, uh, let's look again at the Yamas alignment. So today, Yamas alignment, in order to detect it, you have to send on -site te teams on site. Uh, they come with some lasers, they install that. It takes them about a month or so to give you an answer, and 30,000 K, approximately. What we do is we give, you, we give uh, 
real-time answers using data sets that they already have uh, using our deep learning algorithms. Uh, our clients can use our tools uh, using an online platform, so it's a fully software solution, easy to implement. It uses, again, their existing data sets, and it gives them predictive maintenance and optimizes their turbines. We are working already with a, a bunch of local turbine operators in, around Berlin, but also with global ones that have turbines around, the, around Europe and utilities from outside of Germany as well, all of which we're helping to uh, optimize their assets. And we're currently looking for a seed, if we're in the middle of our seed round, and we, yeah, we're interested in getting to know any investors here or uh, any, anyone that's in general interested in what we do. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> our names are Dominic, Max is behind the computer, and my name is Adrian. And as Elena mentioned, we are 16 years old. We are from Poland, from Gdynia. And today, we want to present you our project, which is going to change your way of thinking about teenagers' education. OK, and uh, now I will say a couple words uh, what we actually do. Yeah? Uh, Zoe is a messenger bot, uh, which you will, uh, can uh, ask them uh, for a uh, some lessons, some school lesson, and it will be help you with uh, homework or uh, school subjects. Yeah, uh, I know that teenagers can do it using a Wikipedia or a student's book. Yeah, but uh, we think that student's book uh, it's pretty bullshit. I don't know because uh, student's book as uh, for teenagers for teenagers. Uh, as, as it's a misunderstanding, yeah? They need a tool for translate it for them, yeah? For in a clear and easy and funny way, yeah? Uh, uh, and we want to give them this tool. We uh, think about what they love, what they actually love, and where they love to be. And they love to be in the internet, yeah? They love to be on a messenger, they love chatting. and. I don't know, anyone here know a teenagers who don't have any social media account? Uh, I, I don't think so, yeah? Uh, because uh, over 70% of teenagers uh, has got uh, a social media account, yeah? Okay. Um. Uh, now, we, uh, we create a pretty cool working prototype yeah, on a Facebook Messenger. And it's uh, only available in Polish right now, but it's English demo. Uh, we I want to in the future uh, to... <laughs> in the future we dream about insert their many language, yeah, for example, English and uh, Germany. Uh, but, and so far we insert their only information about physics in our demo from gymnasium, uh, but in our MVP, uh, we won't have uh, three full subjects. And for example, uh, every, in the future, every single next will pay, for example, uh, I don't know, one dollar or... Yeah, so right now, here will be our promotional video, so check this out. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, okay. And right now, behind us. Okay, one second. <laughs> and okay, summarizing well, uh, we are teenagers, yeah, uh, as you can see, and we uh, know a teenager's language. Yeah? We know a teenager's problem, 
and we have an idea uh, how we can solve it, yeah, and why we can do it. And uh, w students school as boring, yeah, as, as I mentioned, students school as boring, and uh, students don't want to learn, yeah, it's obviously. And but students love to chat. Students love to chat, and we want to connect these two things to make in one service. It's actually Zoe, yeah. Yeah, we can do this, right? And you, you have contact on the slide for us, and the third link, uh, it's uh, one, our one pager when you can uh, read uh, more about us, about project, and uh, thanks a lot. It yeah, was great to lot. be here. We hope we gave you the picture of our image, which is the teacher of the future. Thank you very much. So my name is Hubert. Uh, I'm uh, from a company called Laboratorium. This basically means laboratory in Polish. I'm also from Poland. Uh, but I want to talk about the product called BigMap. Uh, and I will show it in a second. Uh, BigMap is basically a... a it's basically a tool that you can use to visualize uh, data on maps and publish it online. It's very simple. It's a simple idea, simple, um, simple tour with some twists. Um, basically, it starts it because uh, we, people who created it, think the maps are beautiful. Uh, and they always were, we think. Uh, but the things that you can do with the maps today are just uh, astonishing. You can create really, really beautiful things using uh, using data, using very complicated tools. Uh, the thing is that, uh, well, those maps were not created by my, but the tool I'm talking about. Uh, quite the opposite, actually, because uh, to do things like that, you need some skills, you need some time, you need some, uh, or you need some money. Basically, it, there are some resources you have to, you have to to do things like that. And uh, the tool uh, we created. Uh, were created for journalists, basically people who don't have time, uh, who don't have uh, IT skills, they don't have skills to create things like that uh, quickly during few hours, and also uh, they don't have money to pay for some uh, complicated tools, for tools that... Uh, well, also there is one more thing. Usually the things they, they are doing are quite simple, to be fair, and using uh, very complicated uh, frameworks, very complicated uh, tools are just... Uh, overdoing it. So they, they were needing something else. They created, they created, we created a tool that was, that is much, much easier. Uh, those are actually things that we are creating with this, uh, with this big map tool. And how does it work? Uh, sorry. Um, the thing is, um, when you, when you want to create a map using big map, you just upload some picture, you upload a map. Uh, any map you want. It can be something complicated, but it can be something simple. And then you're doing something that it's, not, it's a little bit low tech. You actually draw on this map. You defining the areas on this map, uh, well, using your mouse. Uh, it's like a Microsoft Paint, something like that. Uh, you, you are not. It's not. Uh, it's not possible to be um, to be accurate, of course. So we uh, we do some. We do. A, we've done a little trick, and we lower the resolutions uh, on this map. So now you can you can do some approximation. You can do some maps that are approximate approximation, but they they are. Informant enough. They are enough. Um, they are enough to uh, to tell the story, and this is something that journalists are care about. Uh, then, of course, then of course you are adding some data, and then there is uh, one more important feature. You just uh, click one button, and you got uh, the map ready to publish. You got a link for this direct link for this uh, for this map, uh, and you got the code you can embed on your on your website. Uh, yeah, and uh, the thing is that. Uh, this is an interactive, so you can you have some tooltips, you have some uh, you have some bookmarks, and so on. It's ready. It's ready to it's ready to use. Those are the uh, visualizations that were made by this by this tool. Uh, you can see this is a France, even it is in a very 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 low resolution. You can see the you can see the shape. This is United States. This is I think uh, Obama versus Romney, 2012, uh, and uh, those are the lowest resolution possible because every dot every Every square is only one state, but it's still informative. It's st you still can see what's, uh, what is the story there. Uh, and the last one is uh, is a distorted map. The size of the the size of the square uh, corresponds with the number of uh, electoral votes. So, three different uses. Uh, everyone very simple. Everyone uh, uh, everyone very 
Uh, yeah, but uh, we believe uh, we believe this is something that you can understand. So it started. Uh, so the tool started as an internal tour of Bocha uh, of Gazeta Bocha. This is one of the biggest or most serious uh, newspapers in um, in Poland. I'm from laboratory. We've built a second version of this uh, of this uh, of this tool. It's still in Polish, unfortunately, but we're working on the uh, on an English beta, like right now. I would like to say it is, it is a few days. But it's probably a few weeks to, to have it in English, uh, and we decided uh, that we're gonna we're gonna start we're gonna have a new company dedicated to uh, uh, to this um, to this tool. Uh, we I'm I'm meaning the Borcha and Laboratorium, uh, and we work on some uh, on some new features. We want some we want our target groups. We want to we want to find some pricing model and so on. Uh, but basically, the thing is working. The MVP is working. You can uh, you can check it out right now uh, if you speak Polish, basically, uh, or you can sign up for an English version uh, and uh, wait some time. Uh, and we're gonna send you some uh, some info when the English version is ready, so we can check it out. You can play with it, uh, and well, I hope you can use it and have fun. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Pierre. I uh, work for a company called Searoutes.com. We are located in Hamburg, and so therefore we love ships. Uh, oh, can I get the clicker? Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, we love ships. That's what we do. Um, we build analytics for ships. So, I'm going to start with something simple. We all use Google Maps in our everyday. However, um, as soon as you leave the road network, there are no roads. There's no roads on the water. And clearly, there's more water than there is Earth. So how is it that we haven't solved the routing problem outside of the road network and that the water is actually not so accessible to all of us? There are about 300 southern ships on the planet currently everywhere. So you think about cruise ships, think about cargo ships, think about sailing boats, think about paddle boards, small ships. All of these ships have the same problems. They need to go from A to B. And they need to avoid weather zones. They need to avoid pirates. They need to figure out what's the best way to go from A to B. And so this is what we've built at Sea Routes. We built the first cloud-based solutions that does that, that allows you to route from A to B, and that optimizes for weather, for tides, for waves, for pirates, um, and basically finds the best route for your specific ship, whether you're a sailing boat or a cargo ship. We launched in last January, and since then we got a, a lot of traction. So currently we have about 700 daily uh, unique visitors, and we've actually doubled these numbers the last two months. Um, we also have an API that's available to our clients that's used by um, Fortune 500 companies. And so currently there are 17, but we hope to continue growing that number. So we think the problem of routing on the water is not only important to captains. It's only also useful to others. So obviously, in the maritime world, it's useful to port authorities. It's, it's useful for ship brokers or ship owners. But it's also important for traders, for instance, that want to know where their sugar cane is going to go to Haiti. Or it's also important for companies like BCG and McKinsey to figure out when their cargo is going to go from Singapore to Shanghai and how much CO2 or how much fuel this is going to cost. So it's not only for mariners this routing problem, it's for a lot of other people that need to know the same exact information. So mariners use this and they pay about $400 million every year to get accurate um, routing, accurate routes, so that's great, they have in-house solutions for this. But we think this is actually going to double, and if not triple, by 2025 because of a lot of pressure, like regulations on CO2, so people will need to find the most optimal routes. Fuel costs are going to increase, so we'll need to have the shortest possible routes, maybe go with the tide. Global warming is going to increase weather patterns, so we'll need more and more clever routes around weather, uh, around weather patterns. Think about your... Um, cruise ship company that needs to go to the Bahamas and there's lots of hurricanes around the Bahamas so they need to go all around these, these weather patterns. So what do we do differently? 
we're not mariners. We're a group of computer scientists and uh, PhD students. So what we've done is we've extracted the history of all the ship positions all around the world for a given amount of time, and we can reverse engineer the knowledge of captains because we cross-reference that data with weather or with CO2 emission models or tide models or fuel consumption models. So by doing this, we actually bring in the knowledge of mariners, captains, without being captains ourselves. And by doing this, we can find the best route. So we have a team of uh, six guys, actually, so only three up there. Uh, the three of us are all sailors. And this is actually kind of how this story started. Karsten is the founder of Vessel Tracker, which is a pretty big company and successful company in that field. He's been in the maritime space for 15 years. Um, we have our great um, chief meteorologist officer that built our tide model. Really, really smart guy. And I've been working as a quant for Deutsche Bank for a long time, but now I do maritime. So what's our roadmap? How to make that vision grow? Well, um, we think that by the beginning of 2019, we can get there. Uh, 100, 100,000 users and 300 clients is our target. Um, and so for this to grow, we need funding and we need strategic partners, people that are willing to develop this with us. Um, and so um, think about this. I'll leave you with just this one thing. Next time you go off-road, next time you go on the water, are you going to use Google Map or what, what route will you take? Which tool would you use to figure out where to go? So. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh, and this is Ben. And yeah. we're from Go Get Duo. We're a company based in Berlin. And how do I? Oh. So what is Go Get Duo? Go Get Duo is a platform where, that we created on an app that uh, allows users to share time or skills to help each other out. So we believe that uh, when you have a problem, a lot of times the solutions can be found all around you in the community that you're in. But uh, just to illustrate our point, we're going to focus on one of the biggest annoyances in life, which is being a newbie. So as we all know, Berlin is, is a hub. And lots of people come here every year, every month. Uh, I think it was like 150,000 people last year alone. So when you're new in town, there are a lot of things that can be pretty annoying and pretty difficult. So you don't know the, your surroundings, you don't know your environment, maybe you don't know the language, and uh, most importantly, maybe you don't know the people around you. So just to share a story with you, this is my story. And um, I was new in Berlin, I had just gotten my first apartment, Somehow, I managed to lock myself out. And at that time, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know how to speak German. And I didn't have any supplies at home. So somehow, I made it back in. And that's basically what happened. And, uh, but before this happened, I didn't know what to do. So I was basically dripping blood on my floor, trying to stop this, and uh, trying to figure out my next move. After a little while, I decided to knock on my neighbor's door and ask for a band-aid so I could patch up myself. And um, he gave me the band-aid, but after that, he helped me to call a cab. He told the cab where to go, and he sent me to the hospital, and I was fine. So that raised the question of um, why it was so hard for me to find help. You know, when it was just there, I didn't know. Maybe you don't know that the help is there, or maybe you're too shy to ask. And that's pretty much why we created Go Get Do. Hi, everybody. Um, so how many times have you guys found yourself uh, suffering in silence because you really need to get something done, but you didn't have the tools or the skills or maybe even the time or maybe even just the motivation to get it done in the first place? Or perhaps, you know, like you'd be moving house. I'm doing that at the moment. Pain in the neck. Uh, you know, uh, basic electric work. Challenge at best. Um, or even maybe you're too sick to go to the, to the apotheca. Or maybe you're just like Josh here and was just a little bit too shy to ask for help. So we created Go Get Do and it enables you to be able to post your jobs uh, through the platform so you can find uh, help from local people, you know. Uh, which, uh, uh, sorry, so after you, after you post, uh, you can get real-time applications, followed by where you can negotiate. And oh, hello, oh, sorry. 
sorry, dodgy mic, no, dodgy me, excuse me, uh, uh, communicate and facilitate fair and secure payments, uh, making getting your stuff done really easy. Um, if you, on the flip side though, if you somebody that needs a little bit of money or you've got a little bit of time or some skills and you want to help other people out, then you can also uh, put yourself out there and you can help other people in your local area. <clears throat> So uh, basically, since, since my accident, or if it was an accident, um, I, I've actually used GoGetDo a lot. And we have a working model that we have personally employed. I have helped fix lamps. I have helped assemble furniture. I've helped to dog sit. And I've even done like very Berlin-specific things, like stay in an apartment while you wait for the internet guy to come. But at the same time, people have also helped me to clean my house, to do our events as well, and even to clean out our closets. So it's, it's kind of like a dual-sided thing where you help people to help you. <laughs> and I mean, with regards to, uh, to the potential market, um, in 2016, we had 13 million people actively engaged in, uh, in the gig economy which is approximately worth of around 750 million euros, and that's in 2016 alone. Um, so, but what we like to think is that GoGetDo is there to kind of create more of a kind of gig community rather than a, a, a gig economy. So what we are really happy about and what we really believe is that help is always just around the corner. And with the app, you can really find the help and it can really kind of help you to kind of change things uh, and bring everybody together. And, uh, and, you know, just, and that's it. And just kind of really kind of help one another. Thanks. And uh, if you've got any questions, don't, 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 don't hesitate to yeah, come find us. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, quick question ahead. Who of you guys has ever been responsible for a software project? Quick show of hands. Okay, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I believe we all in this room have something in common. We don't like uncertainty, and that's why we plan. Think about it, like when you go out with your friends, you make a plan ahead. And especially in business, we plan so much, and sometimes, and this is what this series reminds us of, stuff happens to plans which sucks. They fail. Truth be told, you know that. A lot of software projects go over time, they go over budget, and some of them fail so bad that they sometimes threaten an entire department or an entire startup or a company. And we came down while our journey to the one critical thing which makes planning uh, such a critical point in executing a project. And this is humans are horrible at estimating the reality. Deckard is project planning on autopilot. And Deckard is an AI which understands your software project and your company in depth. We look at your performance, we look at your resources, and we look at your technologies you use in your daily work. And then, when you come up with new plans, oh, this looks disformatted, okay, I need to fix that. When you come up with new plans and new projects, um, we directly provide, uh, provide you automatic planning and optimized road mapping. So we predict for you, because when we talk to project managers, they always tell us, okay, our development teams, they're predicting, some are predicting, some are not, some are a bit positive, some are a bit negative. In the end, it all ends up in the same thing, bad planning. And we take it a step further for you. This, what you see here, is all fully automated from all your data, from your past, from your performances. We Go through your Jira, through your GitHub, through your, uh, through your project management tools, and we take it all into gun charts for you. Or if you want to have a different view, um, we take it into a flow chart so you have an overview of all your resources. Everything automated, everything in real time, and optimized to your resources and your priorities. How we do that? We are here to talk a bit about data and how it works. We look at your team 
at your resources, at your workflows, at your processes, and we take the data from your past. We learn on that with a recursive learning algorithm. We try to predict your past from your past, and then we're able to predict the future for your software projects from today, from your open tasks, your epics, and everything. Oops. OK. Um, when we have worked with clients, in the end, when we ask them, OK, how, how do you feel about the pilot? What, what do you think? What was the outcome? How much more did you achieve? The guys from Axel Springer were really excited. Like they, th they said, yeah, well, we achieved a bit. It felt nice. OK, it was cool. And in the end, when we told them, you closed 35% more issues and tickets in one sprint, they were like, whoa, oh my god, we didn't expect that to happen. The guys from Lamudi, when we interviewed them, they saved around one and a half hours per day. They spent usually on uh, forecasting, predicting, fixing gun charts, and everything. So pretty cool stuff, which is really um, helpful for project managers in real life. What we're doing, it's a software as a service platform. It has Jira and GitHub fully integrated. We can easily integrate every other project management platform. You get all your predictions directly into your project management platforms. and. It's, of course, running on servers based in Germany, so data protection law, check. If you want to get in touch, talk to me or to our co-founder, to our founder, Leila, and uh, stop planning, start predicting. Use Deckard. Thanks. Hello. My name is Vadim, and I am CTO of SoulCare Foundation, and we are building healthcare platform on blockchain. Market we are addressing is huge. Uh, these are numbers only for the United States. Uh, annual healthcare spend for 2015 in the United States was uh, $3.2 trillion. And only even less than half of that money was actually, wasn't spent on delivering care, but rather on something else. Our platform is redefining how care is being delivered how care is being coordinated, and how benefits are being administrated. Uh, in particular, if we look at the Medicaid program, for example, uh, it's a very good example. This research made by our uh, advisory board member, Dr. David Randall, a healthcare economist. Uh, again, for 2015, spent on Medicaid was six, uh, five point, uh, 550 billion dollars, and out of that five, almost 600 billion dollars, 30 percent was spent on administration, waste, and fraud, which is about 30 percent. Uh, for those who are familiar with financial industry, uh, normal percentage like fee for transaction on average is three percent. So, for healthcare, it is 30. And mission of our platform is actually to get rid of those 30% and bring it down uh, below 10 and uh, luckily to 3%. Uh, our key philosophy point is that there is no way when centralized system can address all those needs. Healthcare is highly regulated and highly segmented area. In particular, you have commercial insurance, you have government insurance, you have self-insured population. Then if you go deeper, uh, if you go deeper, yeah. Even for example, in a PPO, you have uh, populations with a specific needs. And current approach of building a system and then trying to address the needs of each population with that system doesn't work. So instead, we're building decentralized system with a relationship-centric approach where we're combining all the major stakeholders of healthcare, those are patients, doctors, pharmacies, labs, uh, insurers, and uh, splitting them into protocol pairs and defining relations for each of those protocol pairs.
key components of our platform, as I said, is a care protocol, then is a care wallet, which is a client application specific for each stakeholder, which connects him to the network. Then we have care marketplace and care cards, actually, which gives endless possibilities for care wallet hold holders. Uh, for example, regardless of the jurisdiction, regardless of the geolocation, uh, if you have knowledge, if you have uh, skills, if you know, for example, how to treat diabetes somewhere in Asia, you can encapsulate your knowledge, publish care card on the marketplace, and make it accessible to the uh, patients of care administration network. Uh, we we are also coordinating and connecting all the key stakeholders together. As I said, individuals, doctors, hospitals, and others. Oh, sorry. These are our goals. And we targeting to get funding for our hard cap, actually, $257 million, which is not too much for what we are doing based on our experience. We spent decades in building health insurance exchanges for the United States, uh, implementing uh, part of Obamacare program. $250 million is actually average cost of Medicaid system for one single state, and uh, we're actually going to address all the needs with that budget. This is our advisory board. Uh, we have a very strong team. We have a CIO, CIO of Pentagon. We have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Randall, who is our uh, advisory board economist. We have also Congressman James, James Moran. And we are currently running ICO. Uh, our pre-sale already started. We primarily targeting on institutional investor. And uh, that's it. Thank you.